Mesdames et messieurs, bonsoir, rebonsoir. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening to all of you. Welcome for this uh, fourth conference of the Wright Colloquium for Science. It's the 20th edition this year. We are reaching the end of uh, the colloquium, but uh, there are still uh, many of you here, and it is a big pleasure to notice this. Uh, welcome to all of you who follow us online. My name is uh, Olivier Desibourg. I'm a scientific journalist, and I am the one who has the pleasure to moderate these discussions every night. Just as with every edition, we have the privilege to welcome renowned scientists from the whole world. Tonight, we will have another expert. Just like every night, I'm thinking of uh, all the conferences that we've heard so far. Uh, the red thread is uh, the five elements. Um, and um, to take the words of uh, Thierry Courvoisier, we uh, refer to the long tradition of uh, scientific research. And it's also a way to notice that uh, observing nature is the best way to answer the questions that are suggested by our environment. And uh, tonight you will hear about the oceans and about uh, uh, the air, which is uh, right above the ocean, and which shed lights in uh, um, surprising fields, like, for example, uh, COVID. Uh, as you know, uh, the evening will be divided in two parts. First of all, the conference, and then a session of questions and answers. You will be able to ask your questions in English or in French here in the room or uh, online where there is a dedicated space where you can uh, ask your questions and uh, your questions will be directly transmitted to the speakers. So we heard about uh, earth, fire, water, and today we'll hear about air and the aerosols, the particles in air. And for that, we have the immense pleasure to welcome uh, Kim Prather, who is a professor at the Distinguished Chair in Atmospheric Chemistry, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. And I would like to invite Jean-Pierre Fall, who is a professor of physics in the university in Geneva, to introduce her. Good evening, everyone. It is a huge privilege and honor, but also a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Kimberly Prather. Uh, she is uh, uh, the distinguished chair in atmospheric chemistry and also distinguished professor at Scripps uh, Institution of Oceanography in San Diego. I've known uh, Kim for a while, and I know that well, when she was a teenager, she was not necessarily attracted by sciences until she started uh, following classes in uh, University of California in Davis, where she uh, fell in love with uh, chemistry. We'll see later that uh, uh, she will uh, address uh, much more topics uh, during her career. Uh, she published around 250 articles, 230 publications in a wide range of uh, scientific journals. One uh, of her principal research relates to instruments that make it possible to uh, better understand and the sources of uh, these uh, uh, aerosols and their role in uh, the modification of clouds. She has in, uh, invented mass spectrometers and uh, these were uh, so they were able to be carried and it was possible to put them in uh, planes in order to understand how clouds are formed 
around aerosols, and in particular, biological aerosols. In 2009, she created and became the director of the NSF Center for Impacts of Aerosols on Environment Chemistry. The name of it is uh, CAIS. And as you will hear uh, uh, tonight, uh, uh, this made it possible to uh, transplant the complexity of uh, uh, the environment in a laboratory and uh, to investigate how phytoplankton um, can, uh, bacteria and viruses can have an influence uh, in uh, the chemistry, clouds and climate. She has been, uh, she was very surprised when in uh, 2020 she heard uh, that uh, it was enough for people to stay apart uh, one meter from each other in order to have a protection from uh, COVID-19. During COVID-19 uh, pandemics, Kim was active in scientific communication related to airborne transmission of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. She gave uh, uh, hundreds of interviews to the media and she led the defense uh, regarding change of politics to protect against um, this uh, virus and uh, to help uh, put an end to uh, this pandemic. She also convinced the Dr. Fauci in the US that the airborne uh, viruses can uh, travel much further than one meter uh, 50. Her publication in the Science uh, Journal in 2020 is the one that has been the most uploaded in the history of the Science Journal. Among the prices, and the awards that she received. She was elected member of four prestigious academies, American Academy of Arts uh, and Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and National Academy of Sciences, among others. She also received an impressive number of other awards. Uh, but it would take too long to quote them all. Kim uh, has uh, been involved in communicating sciences to young people with activities in her lab, conferences and schools, articles in uh, scientific uh, journals uh, for lay people. And these uh, achievements are very much appreci appreciated by the Dudley Wright Foundation. I personally uh, have known uh, Kim through her publications uh, for many years. But I uh, visited her for the first time in San Diego only 10 years ago. And uh, it was in the framework of our Planet Solar Deep Water Project. Uh, maybe you remember uh, this project. And uh, I will end my presentation here. And I have the big pleasure to welcome Kim. I ask you to uh, give her a round of applause. The floor is yours, Kim. Good evening. It is uh, my pleasure and honor to be here um, tonight. And I'd like to thank uh, the Wright Foundation and Jean-Pierre for the invitation to be here and tell you a little bit about the research that we're doing. And my brain has been going all week, and I'm going to try and sort of um, wrap things together as best I can. And, uh, you know, basically, this is sort of my view of, uh, or our view of, of the, how aerosols, tra you know, are transmitted around the world. And so, uh, I want to start, though, with just sort of the motivation behind what we're doing. Uh, as we know, our planet is getting warm really fast. In fact, things are changing much faster than anyone predicted. And so, you know, basically 10 of the last hottest years on record have occurred since 2010. I realize I'm not pinned to the thing, uh-oh. Okay, um, so yeah, so um, basically, you know, 2021 came in high. If you just look, these are since 1880. They've all happened in this, in this basically in the last 10 years, 20 years. And so, you know, base, we're thinking about We've been thinking about why. Why is this happening? Why is it going so fast? It's people. 
We've bumped up the number of people from 1 billion in 1800 to 8 billion. It's, I looked it up today. You can go to this worldometer. It's great. You can see how fast people are being born and dying. And today we're at 7.999 billion people. And so if we think about people, you know, basically, what do people need to live? They need energy, they need food. And, and so, you know, as we add more and more people, we create more and more pollution. And so where does this pollution go, is the question. And I think there's been confusion that people, especially in the air, I'm representing the air part of the five elements. In the air, people think, since it's invisible, most of it's invisible, I mean, you can see smoke and things like that, but after a while, you look around in this room, for example, you don't see anything, but there's a lot of pollution in this room. So, stepping, you know, sort of through this and thinking about the atmosphere. You know, I asked kids in kindergarten, you know, when we release pollution in the air, does it just escape to outer space? And little kids will tell me, no. They know that it can be held down close to the ground. So this is a picture from the International Space Station. And it's not a cartoon, it's real. And there's this little thin skin close to the Earth called the troposphere, where we live. And it has a cap on top. And so when we release pollution, air pollution, it, go, it gets trapped in that layer, held close to us. It doesn't escape into outer space. And so, you know, basically, it can build up over time. But one of the biggest aspects, I think, of confusion by the public is that when you think of air pollution, we know that when we put restrictions on our you know, regulations on our emissions, we can watch the air clean up in a few days. The air suddenly is nice and clear. So I think there might be some confusion by the public that we can do the same thing for climate change, except this is where atmospheric chemistry comes to play. CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, all the greenhouse gases, they don't just disappear in a few days when you stop emitting them. They build up, they don't react, basically. So they build up in the atmosphere, for th up, some of them up for thousands of years. So if we just stop emitting, it's still there. And so all of the CO2 that we've put out is, has just built and built and built. And if we stop emitting today, it's still gonna increase for a while. So that is where they're, again, I think it's something that from a, you know, I, spend a lot of time communicating science. That's one of the biggest points of confusion. And so what can we do about it? I don't focus as much on the greenhouse gases. I will say that, you know, the greenhouse gases, we know how much we've put out. We know how much they absorb, you know, how much they're affecting our planet. We know really well, and I'll show that in a minute. Aerosols, on the other hand, we don't. And so I study aerosols a little, you know, there's examples shown here. Dust and sea spray are the two most abundant sources of aerosols on the planet. There's also smoke, air pollution. We heard about volcanoes earlier. These are all different sources, and they range in size from a few nanometers up to microns, and they can exist in the atmosphere for a couple of weeks. What I love about aerosols, and I've grown to appreciate about aerosols, you can emit aerosols on one side of the globe, and they will circle the globe, and it takes about two weeks. So a key thing about the air compared to the other compartments is the, the atmosphere has no walls. We share our air globally. We get our air from, as I'll show, from Africa and Asia and the US. We export our pollution to Europe. We're all in this together. This is truly a global problem that we have to work out. So let's just step back and think about how it works and how aerosols affect things. We'll start with greenhouse gases. So in comes the sun, it emits what's called ultraviolet visible light that comes into the earth, gets absorbed by the earth, and gets re-emitted as what we call infrared or heat. And around the earth, and this was talked about earlier this week, I think our first talk this week, there is a blanket, there's a bunch of gases like CO2, the greenhouse gases, and those absorb, can absorb and basically trap that heat. The more CO2 we put in the atmosphere, the more methane we put in the atmosphere, the more nitrous oxide we put in the atmosphere, the thicker, you have to think of this as like a thermal blanket. The blanket just gets thicker and thicker and thicker. 
As was described, th there's a good side to this in that it makes our planet inhabitable. So there was already CO2 in the atmosphere before humans came along. It's about 280 ppm, and that has now crept up to about 420 ppm since humans started putting out lots, and basically since the Industrial Re Revolution. So what about aerosols? Well, you can think of them as, in, they have benefits in some ways. They can actually do two things, interacting with the sun, which is called the direct effect. They can actually b block the light from ever getting in, and that will lead to cooling. So they actually offset much of the greenhouse gas warming. That's only certain types. It depends on their composition. We heard about volcanoes. Sulfate is a great reflector. It's like little mirrors. It just bounces it back to space. So it never, you, you turn off, you, or you slow down, I would say, the greenhouse effect. But something like soot is black. There's also brown stuff in smoke. Those things actually can absorb light and heat it. So the tricky part about aerosols is, depending on their composition, they have very different effects on our, on our climate. And so this is what we refer to, as I say, as the direct effect. The effect that has the largest, single largest uncertainty on our understanding of climate, and therefore our ability to predict the future. So you hear people say, it's going to get really warm, or it's maybe not going to get that warm, and you see the uncertainties, they're massive. I think we saw some this week. This is what's driving it. It's the, it's the effect of aerosols on clouds. At the center of every cloud drop is an aerosol. At the center of every ice crystal is an aerosol. But not all aerosols make clouds. You would not have clouds on this planet if there weren't aerosols. And so a huge part of my research for now 30 years has been trying to figure out what actually seeds clouds, what actually, you know, how does that change the cloud properties. You've seen clouds where you see sort of dark clouds versus bright white clouds. The bright white clouds are our friends. They are really reflective and cool things off. The darker clouds are ones that are about ready to rain are not nearly as good as it, at it. And what determines those cloud properties, how long they stick around, where they rain, how much they rain, all comes back to aerosols. They play a critical role in our climate system, both globally and locally from a precipitation perspective. And that's what's called the indirect effect. So there's been many reports we refer to as IPCC. The sixth one just came out. This is from an older one. Things aren't changing that much is what I will say. You can see on the left are the greenhouse gases. There's a line at zero. Everything above zero, red, is warming. And you see the greenhouse gases are all listed there. The most common greenhouse gases are all listed there. Then you start to go a little further, and you see blue going down. Those are the aerosols. Those are the direct and the indirect effect. Both, on a, you know, the net effect is, is cooling. But the take home from this that I want to point out is the size of the uncertainty, that gold bar on the one about clouds. You can see it's huge. And you take that bar and you compare it to the bar on the far right, which is the total effect of humans on our planet, and they're almost the same size. So this means that, you know, this is the part we have to understand. And why do we have to understand it? We have to understand it because we have to figure out how much and how fast we have to change things to have a chance. That's why. And so this has been the driving force of my research for my entire career. So one of the things we note, we, we're seeing, you've heard of tipping points this week. Some things are changing fast. The temperature isn't just going to, like, CO2, I think a lot of people, again, think CO2 goes higher, the temperature will just step up, and eventually we'll get to this point, we'll get a little warmer, a little warmer, a little warmer, and then we'll turn it off and it'll, we can cool it. That's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen are these tipping points where we push things too far and start to, you know, melt glaciers. You know, what happens then? You know, basically we're starting to see it in the weather. We're starting to see more extreme weather events. So what we're basically, instead of seeing sort of average rainfall in various places, we're seeing either flooding in some regions or drought in others. So we've got sort of bimodal distribution. And that has to do with, we heard about circulation patterns last night in the ocean. Those are driving the circulation patterns in the atmosphere, and that's changing where the aerosols are going, and that's changing the clouds, and that's changing where the precipitation is falling. That's how, what we've been looking into for a while. So the signs are there that Mother Earth right now is really unhappy. She is trying, and the microbes, I would argue, are trying to keep things in a stable temperature range. And unfortunately, she's kind of losing right now. 
So we see it in the form in California, we see it in fires, we see four or five hurricanes over the Atlantic at the same time for the first time ever. We see flooding, we see drought. And when you are asked, when I'm asked often about, oh, the last hurricane, whatever it was, I think it was Ian, uh, you, know, do, you know, is that due to climate change? You cannot attribute any one, any one weather event to climate. But what you look for is trends like this, where you can see these are the number of billion dollar climate disasters. And the trend is, it's getting higher. And this was one of my earlier slides. I looked, and it's been updated. You can see, if you go, go back, you can see where it was. I added on a couple more years, and it's even higher. So it's just, it's just going higher and higher. And so, from a cost perspective, I think people are worried about what the investment would be to slow things down. But these costs are just going to get higher and higher the longer we wait. So one of the things we did, you know, I built an instrument, I was a physical chemist, and I built an instrument that filled an entire lab. I was just going to measure things in the lab, I was never going to go outside. And instead, we built this instrument, which I'll show in a minute, a mass spectrometer, and we peeked out the window and learned all kinds of things, because it was a new way of looking, and we could tell right away what was in the air. So we shrunk it, smaller, 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 and we did a bunch of field studies. We went on ships, we went on planes, we went in mobile labs, we been all over the world, and, but the, one of the coolest things we ever did was fly through clouds. And actually, for the first time, to measure the aerosols directly into our instrument and say, what seeded this cloud? More importantly, what seeded this cloud and does, how does that change the cloud properties? And how does that change whether that cloud rains or snows or does nothing? And the meteorologists pushed back. They thought I was crazy. They weren't shy about making that known, um, and, but that doesn't slow me down, that just always has given me motivation, thankfully. And so, you know, basically, we, we flew through the clouds, we had all the cloud microphysics on the plane, we had all the chemistry on the plane, that's me telling, with the headset telling the pilots where to fly in the clouds to figure out, you know, what the clouds were made of. And we discovered something really big. We actually just showed, we thought, we thought, this is over California, we were paid by the state of California because we thought we were putting too much pollution in the clouds, which can actually shut off precipitation. So we were going in with this hypothesis, and instead we found out that on days where there was lots of snow at the ground, that the, that the aerosols had come all the way from Africa, across the Pacific, the opposite way that people kind of traditionally think of dust and bacteria going. Twelve over 12,000 miles these aerosols go. So coming back to COVID, which we'll talk about at the end, when people ask me if they go further than six feet, this is why I uh, smile, is the nice way to put it. Um, but basically, you know, we bas this is huge. We showed that Mother Nature has figured out this incredible way to seed clouds and make them more efficiently produce snow and water. Snow is the key ingredient. And I won't go into details, we can talk about it at the end, but it was a big discovery at the time. So then the question became, not only did we see dust, it turns out dust is really good at forming ice, and so are bacteria, but seeing the microbes it made the news. It was on the cover of Discover, and the clouds are alive. Where does this dust and bi biology come from? Where do these bacteria come from? Bacteria can form ice at temperatures as warm as negative one degree C. If there is no nothing in the cloud to form ice, these clouds can stay liquid to negative 38 degrees C and do nothing. That's when they just do nothing. So to get precipitation, you need something to make ice, and bacteria turn out to be the magic ingredient. We know a lot about microbes that come from dust. It's pretty easy to go out and scoop stuff up in a desert and, you know, sam collect dust in the air and look at the ice nucleating ability. We know virtually nothing about the microbes that come out of the ocean. Yet, the ocean represents 71% of our planet. So, around this time, there was a call for centers from the National Science Foundation. I had been doing field studies at this point for 20 years. And we said, We're, you know, this is too hard to figure out in the real world. Because if you remember that video of the aerosol circling, there's nowhere you can go right now to just study just the ocean. Human pollution is everywhere. And so, how do you tease out what the ocean does by itself without the impacts from humans? So we proposed to the National Science Foundation that we were going to make a center, and we boldly said, we're going to move the ocean 
the atmosphere, the biology, the physics. We're going to move it all into the lab, and we're going to simulate all the processes just like it happens in the real world, which had never been done before. Again, people thought we were a little, a little crazy, but you know, this was what we had to do. We just, we, basically what had happened was we would do field studies, we'd go out for a couple of weeks, we'd measure things, and we would take what we got, but we'd make the best story we could, but we couldn't ever be 100% sure that we really, really understood what was happening. In this situation, if we could really do this, we would be back in our comfort zone as chemists and be able to invoke, a, you know, put it, induce a change and then measure a response. And that's what I'm gonna spend time talking about for the, you know, for the bulk of my talk. How we are able to now induce a change and measure a response. And it's clear as can be. So it works, otherwise I probably wouldn't be standing here, but it's just, it's, an ama it's much easier, I will say. Much, much, e it's hard, but it's much easier still than the field work where you just don't know, you just, there's too many variables, 20 things change at once and you just, are never really sure. So it's a massive center. I have to acknowledge all the people that are involved because, again, I wouldn't be standing here. Lots of people, hundreds of people over, it's now 12 years that I've been the director. So here is the sort of grand challenge, is to you know, basically make sea spray and make an ocean that looks just like the real thing. And what had people done before? They'd made sodium chloride because the ocean's full of salts, right? But what about all that biology? So we'll, we'll get there. But the point is we were trying to you know, thinking about the other place, what, we were really, what I was really interested in was heterogeneous chemistry. What, what I mean by that is a particle reacting with gases. And we knew from, from for example, the, the stratospheric ozone hole that, you know, people were able to do fundamental chemistry in the lab and explain why there was a hole. Troposphere, the, the good thing about the stratosphere is it's so clean. There are only a few chemical compounds you have to do that with, so it was possible to do lab studies. Here, it's not the case. There's just this com crazy complex mixture of salts and organics and proteins and everything, and I'll, I'll come there. But the bottom line is we were trying to get the real thing, the real system in the lab. Just a little bit about the instrument that started my career. It's what's called a single particle mass spectrometer. It allows us to analyze the size and chemical composition of each individual particle one at a time. I won't go through how it works here, but the take home is that if you look on the left, what people had assumed was that all particles in the atmosphere, if you, you collect things on a piece of filter paper for you know, a week or two weeks, that every particle looks the same and behaves the same. And that's not correct. What we're able to do is actually look at the composition of each one flying by 50 a second, and we could actually just count them up, and we can figure out where they came from, we can understand the reactions, and you know, it really was an advance forward, and there were a number of groups that all were kind of doing this type of advance at the same time. So thinking about this concept of the climate and the oceans, where we know the oceans are such a big part, you know, we, we can put this in the perspective of the steps that we have to go through to be able to understand the, the direct and the indirect effect. You know, what are the parts that are so important? Getting to, we've talked a lot this week about feedbacks. This is where the ocean and atmosphere, they do talk to each other. So how do we sort of tease that out? So one thing we have to think about, the hardest part of this experiment is the biology. I am not a biologist. I have grown to appreciate biology a lot. But the biology everybody thinks about are phytoplankton, as was mentioned in the introduction. And so, and this gets to the point of sort of, this is another planetary thermostat. Mother Nature, is this the way that the ocean, can the oceans, through biology, maintain our temperatures in check? And this is the Gaia hypothesis, part of the Gaia hypothesis decades ago. And you know, there, was a th there was thinking that if things got too hot, too fast, the microbes could just, either the sea spray would change or the microbes would emit different gases and that would change the clouds, which would cool things off. That's, that's the hypothesis that's been out there. It's been supported, it's been debunked, it's been supported, it's, it's just, it's very controversial. I personally am a pretty strong believer that there is something to be said for these feedbacks that are going on. And I, I think you probably will by the end, um, and I'll lay out sort of what we've learned in order to be able to make this case. This just shows phytoplankton from space, chlorophyll, and um, basically uh, you can just see the ocean is very, very variable. And so we wanted to reproduce this in the lab. 
So what do you have to do? What are the steps? You can't just take salt like people have been doing forever. That's what chemists were doing, just make sodium chloride. We had to think about seawater. And in one drop of seawater, there's hundreds of millions of viruses, bacteria, phytoplankton, proteins, lipids, even we've shown enzymes get out of the ocean. And all of these get enriched in this thin skin that sits on the surface of the ocean. And so if we want to do this right, we want to understand what goes from the water to the air. And it turns out there's thousands of ways to do this incorrectly, and we were doing it, everybody was doing it. There's only one way to reproduce the correct way, which is simulating the bubbles in a real breaking wave. So I've become a bubbleologist. I love bubbles. Oceanographers have, have taught me. I, it's beat into my head. We have to get the bubbles right, and so I will talk about why that is. The shocking thing to me is one of our big discoveries has been showing how much in the way of gases are coming out constantly from the ocean. It's a forest underwater. Why wouldn't they be? But they're incredibly reactive, and so people have missed them. They've underappreciated the ocean as a source of these gases, which are playing a massive role in our clouds and our climate. And so this is something that we've gotten at. So thinking about how do we control the chemistry, what happens in the real world is you have these phytoplankton blooms that are initiated by dust depositing nutrients to the ocean usually. And what we wanted to replicate, again, working with microbiologists, this was not our, you know, we, this is where it's so interdisciplinary and so important. And a, micro, a very wise microbiologist, Farouk Azam, who's been just essential to everything we've done, said to me, Kim, everybody's fixated on the phytoplankton. The phytoplankton are just the food. The bacteria are everything, the heterotrophic bacteria. So he, he's the one that discovered this thing called the microbial loop. So the idea is you induce a bloom, the bacteria take off, the viruses take off, everybody start. there's a feeding frenzy that begins, and you get this complex array of different compounds that you could never, ever replicate yourself. So I call the little microbes our organic chemists. They make our molecules for us. And so we really respect these microbes. So what are the steps? So first is the, the, what I call the microbial loop to give us up to 10 to the 15 different organic compounds in proper proportions. They do quite well. Then the bubbles. What about the bubbles? And we'll talk more about the bubbles in a second. And the gases that are coming out. But now we have our starting material. We're happy because we're chemists and we get to finally do our reactions. It took a long time, like seven years to get to this point. We're doing the reactions now. And then once we do the reactions, how do those reactions change the ability of the gases, of the particles, and how do they change the clouds? In, in other words, how do they change the ability of these to uptake water? Getting back to the point about model systems, you think about, you know, the, I guess the top right hand corner shows you the model of a sea spray particle and it shows you a, a liquid droplet with salts in it with little tails sticking out that are surfactants. And it's this is well-ordered surface. And the predictions from model studies was that when, when sea spray gets coated with organics, it shuts off reactions. But we found through numerical modeling from biology that that's not what a sea spray particle looks like at all. When you build the chemical complexity, it's worth it. You get a different answer. And so this is now a complete shift in what people think about in terms of what's coming from the ocean. Another, as I mentioned just briefly, I'm not going to go into this too much. I love these microbes. I'm an aerosol person, but I've become a gas phase. We were building gas phase, small little gas phase instruments. I, they're incredible. They're like, they, I call them our, you know, as these microbes are releasing gases constantly, that's their form of communication. They tell you if they're happy, they tell you if they're stressed, they tell you if they're hungry, they tell you if they're under attack. These are the chemical smoke signals of our environment. They also tell you whether things are healthy or not. And so, you know, I believe that these microbes in the ocean can serve, and it's, we're still working on this part, they can serve as the canaries in the coal mine of how that whole ecosystem is behaving, and we're working on that now. So, bubbles. So one of the biggest lessons I learned early on on the upper left corner is uh, just it's what it is. It's number of bubbles is a, and across the x-axis is as a function of size. And what you see is there's a wide range, like three orders of magnitude. And it, it's not random. You get this from every breaking wave. This, and it's described mathematically. There's a little kink in it even that's called the Hinza scale. And so it's incredible. Like this is what we had to reproduce in the lab. So we've been working on this, and this just shows you bubbles. And we have a microphone in there that listens to the bubbles from the breaking waves. 
and you can basically, this is how, when you do this, every time you do this, you get that same distribution back. And this is using real breaking waves. I'll talk more about how we've now translated that from this map. Not everybody can break waves in their, in their backyard, so we've made smaller scale versions of this. But the beauty, and this shows you that, you know, that on the left is the bubbles, and on the right are the aerosols. And there's these little markers, narrow bubble size distributions in red. You can see these little red curves that are much smaller. They're not a huge wide distribution. And what you see is the aerosols, if you don't produce the full spectrum of bubbles, the full range of bubble sizes, you get that sharp red peak, which doesn't look anything like real sea spray in terms of size or composition. But when you get the right bubbles, you get the right aerosols. And this was a huge home run for us to be able to prove that we could do this and do it repeatedly. So let's zoom in. What is going on? Why are the bubbles so important to this process? So this shows the two main production mechanisms of sea spray from bursting bubbles. The one on the left shows you film this thin film, and when it ruptures, you make all these little film drops that dry down and become aerosols. Those are the small particles. And on the right, once that bubble ruptures, you get this jet that comes out of the middle, sampling a completely different part of the water. And so that basically means we thought, it had never been proven before, but that means that you'll get a different composition in theory between these different processes. So this is why looking at the single particles and the chemistry is so important, because that's what is making the clouds. There is very different particles, in, we thought, coming out. So just to show you, this was again something that was really big we learned early on, we get completely different composition from the jet drops versus the film drops, and as a function of size. And so that's kind of what this says in a nutshell. You know, one, you're sampling the top thin skin, the oily layer, like when you pour oil on a, you know, oil and vinegar dressing, versus the jets pull deeper, and the bubbles rise through and grab everything. This is an incredibly surface-enhanced process. And so if you don't make that surface correctly, you won't make the particle surface correctly, and that particle surface composition drives everything in the atmosphere. It drives its reactivity, it drives its ability to make a cloud drop, it drives its ability to make an ice crystal. So we did it, we transferred the full complexity, this was the first five years, um, we, you know, we, we, they gave us $20 million for the first five years, we had to prove we could do it, this is how we did it with this wave channel, and we were able to show and make sea spray that looked just like the real world for the very first time in the lab. Then we went further. We started realizing we can't always run a wave channel. We need to make them smaller and smaller. So we made these tanks. We made plunging waterfalls that plunge just at the right frequency. They give us the same bubble size distributions, and they give us aerosols. Not as many, but they still allow us to do studies on much smaller scale. This just shows the full what it looks like when we do a massive experiment. I was over at CERN, saw the cloud chamber, very similar. This is usually empty, but we attach all these instruments. Olivier was there. We attach all these instruments, and everybody appears from everywhere around the world, and we all sample sea spray together. We have lights, we have waves, we have real seawater. It's about, this one's about, uh, it's, I think, this one's, yeah, 3,600 gallons of seawater. Comes straight in from the ocean. We induce blooms and we measure things. So the big question was, as you induce a bloom, you can see on the right, day zero, there's kind of not much color. This is fluorescence, which is signs of life. And so you can see that as a bloom progresses, you get more and more biology. The big question that nobody had been able to answer is does everything just go into the air? And so one of the first things we showed was that you get a wide range of particle chemistries. This is just images with electron microscopy, which shows that not only is the composition of all the particles, a lot of the particles very different, they fall in like about six different classes of particles, different compositions, some that are purely salt, some that are purely organic, and a bunch that are in the middle. But we also can look at the size and see that there's a very strong size dependence. And so we can see that the smaller sizes are mostly organic, more organic rich, at the largest sizes are mostly salts. This has, a hu has huge implications because these different size ranges are involved in different processes in the atmosphere. The other big surprise though, and was it worth it? At this point, I was going, you know, we put all this effort into saying, we're not just gonna run sodium chloride, we're gonna run the real thing. One of the things that really stood out was when you get the composition correct, when I say that, I mean the, the overall um, 
depth profiling. So what's at the surface versus inside? As I mentioned, the surface is everything to reactions, right? So this is what a particle looks like before reaction with nitric acid, which is a common pollutant in the atmosphere. After reaction, it was a huge surprise. All of the ions scrambled. So the things that were on the outside moved to the inside and vice versa. This was not predicted by anyone. It, it was, you know, this is one of those sort of discoveries that you never could predict in advance. Now people are scrambling, trying to understand it. But it shows the reason why we went through so much work to make the correct sea spray. Getting to, that's sort of the salt part, but getting to the organics, we see entire bacteria with phage. The little red, is a, it's being attacked. And we see these intact in the atmosphere. We looked at whether there is any form of enrichment if there's, if it just everything gets out or if only certain things get out. It's, this is really kind of a messy figure, so just, I'll just, the main point I want to make, bacteria are in the circle on the right hand, upper hand corner, anything that's in red is more enriched in the air. And you can get enrichment by a factor of 100,000 of bacteria in the air versus what they were in the water relative to the salts. And so some do and some don't. Blue means there's more in the water. So trying to understand this and again coming back to is there a method to the madness? Are these the good ice nuclei is the big question of the day. Viruses are at the bottom. We're still working. This is a question that's out there. And now we're working towards what are the health implications of breathing all of this. It was mentioned a couple of days ago. What about when you know, wastewater goes in the ocean? All of that becomes aerosolized. So how is that affecting human health? So the question is selectivity. We sample the water, we sample the surface, and we sample the air, and we get different answers. And so there's a huge, huge amount of selectivity that we are now able to probe. And we see interesting structures that nobody ever thought would be there. And the only reason we're able to do that is because we have the right combination of species that are present. This ties into the talk tomorrow, tomorrow night, and you know, uh, Nick will be talking about you know, origin of life. When we first showed these structures, if you look, they, some of them look like little cells. They almost have membranes on them. And so people, when they saw it at first, there had been a hypothesis from, I think this was 2000, yeah, that these were potentially cells. And this could be, you know, cells were forming as things b burst off the surface of the ocean. And this could make, you know, be the origin of life. And so this will be a topic that I, will be fun to discuss. So where are we now? Well, basically, we're looking at, um, we're looking at, you know, adding, we just did this, and I'll show you hot off the press results now. We basically went a step further. Instead of just having breaking waves, which are nice, we worked with those for a long time, we decided to go after winds as well. And so thinking more about the open ocean, you know, and an entirely enclosed system with a smog chamber where we could actually simulate the temperature, you know, we can, actually, we can pump you know, CO2 into the headspace and make an acidic ocean and see how that changes things. This is a massive system. We can even make sea ice in this system that we've just developed. And so the biggest part of the system, though, is the addition of winds. But we can still do all the things I mentioned before. We can do the reactions, but now it's totally integrated, and we can do cloud studies as well. So just to show you, to compare, I, I'll show you a better picture of it in a second, but I just want to, for scale, the bottom left-hand corner shows an arrow pointing down. That used to seem like a really big instrument to me, that big wave channel that we used that I showed you before. That's it. It's tiny compared to this thing. It is, it is a beast, and this is, is what we affectionately refer to as SOARS. So I'm just going to show you the beginning of a video and stay quiet that kind of gives the summary. By my, you'll hear um, my colleague, an oceanographer, who has been the lead on this, um, on this project to get this to work. But I just want to quickly go show SOARS. SOARS is an instrument that reproduces the biology, the chemistry, and the oceanography of the wind-driven sea. SOARS stands for the Scripps Ocean Atmosphere Research Simulator. It's an instrument funded by the National Science Foundation, supported by UC San Diego. We've always known that the air sea boundary is important. What we didn't understand was how the combination of biology and chemistry and wind and waves were all working together to create this unique and special place that impacts weather and climate. How are we going to understand this complex, connected system so that we can 
predict what future climate's going to look like and what future weather's going to look like. So, <laughs> I've already said a lot of that. So, um, so I'll just show you kind of an exciting result that we literally just got. So the cool thing about, the wonderful thing about this is we're able to just, that people have been studying this for decades, like 80, decade, 80 years. And they've been trying to understand what controls the amount of sea spray. Sometimes there's a lot in the atmosphere, sometimes there's very little. And the, the models range by 11 orders of magnitude. So we had some room for improvement. We couldn't fail, right? And so we're able to just sort of, it's an awesome system. I mean, once it works, it was a pain to get it to work. I'm not gonna, it was hard. It was really hard. It's one of the hardest things we've ever done. But once it works, it's incredibly stable. So you just crank up the, the wind, you give it a certain wind speed, you measure the particles. This shows the number of particles as a function of size. So sort of total particles versus size. So you can see at different wind speeds. And it just kind of starts creeping up. So as you add more wind, you get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And so we were gonna make a little plot and kind of, I don't want to say it was boring, but you know, it was, it's such an easy measurement for us. And so we were just like, okay, we'll finally work this out. And this happened. So we hit this range of wind speeds where all of a sudden it just amplified, went off the charts, and it continues to amplify. This is massive. This explains the range, this explains hurricane, like we can actually do better job on hurricane modeling. This is gonna have a huge effect for, you know, heat transfer, aerosols, clouds. I mean, this is gonna change the way uh, climate models treat sea spray. So I just wanted to share, share this one little nugget with you because we just got it. How am I doing on, okay, I'm gonna just touch on the COVID because I think this will be, I think a lot of people here have asked me about this and I've done a number of interviews since I've been here. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about where I've spent a huge chunk of my time for the last few years, which was mentioned before. And you may say, how the heck is she studying, you know, airborne transmission of a virus, an infectious virus? What does that have to do with the ocean? Well, it actually has a lot to do with the ocean, and this shows how. So here's the surface of the ocean, here's the bubbles, here's the sea spray, and, you know, basically all the things that are in the ocean surfactants get airborne and you get sea spray. Same thing with your lungs. It's almost the same composition and it's bubble rupture, and it's, you know, those bubbles, they're back again, right? So you've got bubble rupture, you've got film drops, you've got jet drops, and that's what encases the aerosols when you speak. So it's from the vibrations, again, it's the frequency of vibrations. So I'll just step through quickly because I'm sort of in the hometown of the, sort of in the hometown of the WHO, and this was where we started. February 2020, Tedros mentioned that, you know, the virus is airborne. Then he said it wasn't. Then they said it wasn't. It was taken back within like 15 minutes. And then confusion, mania, from this point forward. And this is when the aerosol scientists came in and said, it probably is aerosols. This tweet that's out there, was put out there at this time, is still there. And so there's a massive amount of misinformation that has confused the public. They say coronavirus, we were not allowed to say it was airborne. It is airborne. It is airborne, but it's definitely, they, you know, it's not, you can't say that but it's definitely in the air, right? This was the confusion, and I, again, I felt terrible for the public, so many of us aerosol scientists jumped in. It's, the messaging's still terrible. If you go into a business, pe people say, Kim, you know, you, why are you continuing to say it's airborne? Obviously, people know this. No, you go into a business, what do you see? You see hand sanitizer still. This is EPA, and we still, they're highlighting cleaning surfaces. I do want to say that's the, the science motivation. The motivation for me to spend so much time on science communication comes from one of my closest friends of my career, Mario Molina, who won the Nobel Prize in 1995 for the ozone hole. And he taught me the importance of not just measuring things, but doing something to help society. And so, you know, he has been behind me, he was behind me, he was my science advisor through all of CASE. Unfortunately, we lost him much too soon. Um, but he was just, he is still, I feel him still pushing me, nudging me along. So this is the paper that was mentioned, and I'll just quickly say, you know, this is, shockingly, has become incredibly downloaded. All it was was just saying, it's being spread by people who don't know they're sick, it's coming out in aerosols, everybody wear masks. That was it. And I got sucked in because some reporter asked me, do I think aerosols go further than six feet? And this image came to mind. So what is the difference? Aerosols and droplets. The medical textbooks say it's all in droplets. Droplets drop. That's where the six feet came from. 
It's not droplets. People aren't, most people aren't coughing and sneezing, right? They, you're infectious before you have symptoms. So there's 1,000 to 10,000 times more aerosols, and aerosols behave like cigarette smoke. They can travel easily across this room if it's not ventilated. I will tell you, I've had my CO2 monitor, I have it with me now, which tests ventilation. This room is incredibly ventilated or I would have my mask on. So, you know, we went on a mission. We were on news. This is John LaPook. I became close friends with the CBS chief medical correspondent. Lindsay Marr had been studying viruses. We were, you know, we just said it over and over and over. We also wrote a paper, a review again in science, and we said it's not just COVID. All respiratory viruses have some airborne component. Just turns out COVID is about 100%. But the other viruses, RSV and flu and all those, so if we wear masks, we saw all of those plummet. And so this is something that if we could just clean our indoor air, that's the mission I'm on now. We're not okay, you know, drinking dirty water. We filter our water, we cook our food, but we're okay with the number one route of entrance to our bodies every day, breathing dirty air, where we spend 90% of our time. It builds up indoors. So you can filter your air, just like you filter your water. It can be cheap. These little Corsi Rosenthal boxes you can build for about $70 each, so it's a nice accessible solution. They breathe the air at 2,000 times the rate of you. So it means that the virus ends up inside of this little minion in a classroom, and the kids build them. They have classroom science projects. It's, they're just incredible. And they outperform a HEPA, and they cost one-tenth as much. I took one to the White House. This was recently. Uh, you know, we share. We're, we're on a mission here. So, you know, it's really important, and I've said it since day one. COVID is airborne. Once we acknowledge it's airborne, it's a fixable problem. We don't have to be going into wave number eight. So let's just, you know, the word has got to get out, and, you know, this is where I spent my time. I had to show the Swiss cheese model, which is the multiple layers of protection that are so important, um, but I just wanted to touch on that. So the last thing I'll quickly, oh yeah, besides showing what you should do, it shows you what you shouldn't do, which is build plexiglass, sit, you know, and all these other crazy things that you need to know why, not just ventilate and leave it alone. People really do appreciate understanding why. So, you know, my wrap-up point is that the Earth is, you know, reaching many tipping points, and we need to talk about it as much as we can and get the word out. Um, it needs all the help it can get. There's many things as individuals, choices we make every day that we need to be making. Um, my favorite part about my job is science communication and teaching the future. They're the ones that are inheriting this mess that we're leaving behind. And the faces and the, you know, they get it. And so this has been, this has really been my favorite part of directing this large center. And with that, I will stop and we will, I guess we'll be talking up here. So thank you very much. Well, Thank you very much, Kim. Comme vous le savez, c'est la richesse de ce colloque. As you know, in uh, this uh, colloquium, we can uh, talk uh, not only to one speaker, but to several uh, speakers. And I have the pleasure to invite on the stage uh, three uh, of the other speakers of this week, Frieden uh, von Blankenburg, Nick Lane, and Steve Sparks. <laughs> So I'm sure you have plenty of questions. Uh, I'll uh, keep the, the word for, let's say, five to 10 minutes at the max, uh, starting to ask questions to our uh, other guests. <laughs> Come back, please. <laughs> we need you. <laughs> OK. Um, and actually, you'll be the last, and you understand why. So I'll, I'll start with uh, you two gentlemen and ask you again, why have you what have you learned tonight, and why is that useful or might, might it be useful for your own research. So Steve Parks, you're a volcanologist for those who weren't here on uh, Tuesday evening. You're also studying aerosols for a different reason. So what have you learned today? Well, uh, firstly, I've learned a huge amount from Kim's wonderful uh, talk. Um, just the variety and complexity of the surface of the ocean and how that feeds into through the wind and the spray and the bubbles into the making the clouds and how interdependent the whole system is. So um, uh, it's really uh, quite striking the microscopic is affecting us on a global scale. I suppose that's the, the first point. It, it does resonate me a little bit with me in terms of, for my field, 
bubbles are very important as well. Um, and the, it's actually the size distribution of bubbles which uh, determine the size of volcanic ash and where it goes around the globe. So uh, there is a, definitely a sort of a parallel there. But um, certainly you've learned a huge amount tonight. Fruit Helm, maybe? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I have learned I should be wearing a mask to reply to you. <laughs> I'll end up with you, but wait. Uh, by coincidence, last week preparing this, uh, this uh, colloquy, I fell on an article which just at exactly at the boundary of uh, what Kim does and also what Nick does. And the title of this article goes, The, the Building Blocks of Life May Have Formed in primor Primordial Sea Spray. So that was just an article published uh, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so <laughs> what do you think of this article and, and the interlink between your research, so you're researching the origins of life, and what Kim does? Um, well, so my research on the origins of life takes place at the bottom of the oceans in deep sea hydrothermal vents. So you may say there's no relation. Um, now, of course, my own ideas on the origin of life are not shared by the majority of the people in the field anyway, so it may simply be that I'm just totally wrong, uh, and life started exactly there, at the air-ocean interface. But there's another aspect, which is that these vents are venting gases, which come out in bubbles, and so we have an air-ocean interface in the vents as well, and we've learnt in our own work that the bubbles really matter too, uh, and I have nothing like the sophistication of Kim in understanding the exact size of the bubble or anything. But, but it, what I've learned this evening is it really matters. The size of the bubbles, the forces that are involved are, are really critical uh, to what's going on. And I need to embrace this in my own research. So that's, that's a major, major factor. I haven't taken it nearly seriously enough, I would say. So we're looking forward to it tomorrow. Maybe, yeah, you want to add something? I just had one question for Kim. Um, the dramatic new results you've got with this sort of sudden tipping into huge difference in the number density, I just wondered what the, 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 the cause of that was and what, um, what was going on, what was causing this transition in terms of the wind getting speedier and speedier and suddenly it all get, goes haywire. So what we think right now, we just literally, this is really hot off the press, but what our hypothesis right now, and we're testing it, um, is that you hit a wind speed where the, um, the wind just, basically you've got the breaking waves and you're kind of blowing a little bit of the spray off the top and then all of a sudden you just start, produce, there's a, like you break past some sheer force barrier where you just rip the top off and those drops go down, hit the surface, and there's like this amplification. They make more spray. So you get this extra step of all those drops in addition to the bubbles are turning on. And we are able, this is an interesting thing we're doing like literally right now my group is looking at this. Turns out you can sort this out because if that's true, then you're gonna get more jet drops. And turns out that jet drops, this is really fine detail but it's kind of cool. The jet drops have a very different charge distribution than film drops. And so we're now measuring the charge distributions of the sea spray and trying to see if all of a sudden we get more jet drops or that shift, and we are, see we are seeing that. So everything points that this is probably what's going on. I have even another question, too. <laughs> um, you, so so the, you, the, I, was, I was stunned by the staggering number of, of viruses, enzymes, and other biological components contained in one droplet of, of, of seawater. And you also explained to us that, that by, by, by wave action and so on, many of these droplets just disperse into aerosols, and that they can be transported really long distances. I, I, I think you mentioned, I don't know what the longest... Transmission they, distance. They go thousands of miles. They can so, get, once they get up, if they get up in the jet stream, they can just go all the so way. So why around. then do we even have microbial or, or, or viral diversity on planet? Shouldn't we have one huge, big, mixed there, uh, 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 habitat? So <laughs> if everything it's partly, mixes via aerosol. Sorry, yeah, that's a great, really good question. Obviously, and, and what I will tell you is that, like, you're right. Like that seems what you would think, but 
the point is, it's kind of like one of those things about nobody's thought about it before. So it's one of the, until we showed it, it's kind of like where you look for your keys, right? Under the lamppost, you only find them there. If you don't know to look, and so there's these little lines and papers that say, how did this microorganism get from this ocean to this ocean? And they come up with all these cockamamie ways that don't make any sense. When it could have just blown, I mentioned the air doesn't have any walls, right? It's easy to be transported, but they've like never considered that. So we see all kinds, we see cholera, we see hepatitis, all these get airborne. And I talked to someone, Rita Caldwell was the, you know, she's the one that figured out the cholera in the water. And I said to her, is it, because we see it gets out in the air really well. And I said, is it possible it could be in the air? Because they, Wikipedia says it's waterborne. And she said, yes, just nobody's ever thought of it. <laughs> I mean, why, why don't infectious diseases then spread globally immediately? They do. Why are they even contained? There are examples, like foot and mouth, hoof and mouth disease or whatever animals will spread through the air. There are examples of things going, you know, Charles Darwin, they found it on his beagle. They found the microbes on his ship in the middle of nowhere. So there's plenty of evidence. They come, actually dust and microbes, and the other shocking thing was people used to rule it out because it's up in the jet stream. So it gets really intense radiation, which should make it, which should kill it, right? But bacteria have morphed and figured, and so have viruses, I think, where they've been able to get embedded in the dust where they get protected. And so when they're protected, they, um, they shield themselves and can make it all the way from one example, Joe Prospero showed this, that microbes from the desert, the Saharan desert, can get all the way across to the Caribbean and still be infectious. So there is, it's, it's out there. It's just not appreciated. We just got funding for a big center to really go out and map it. It just hasn't been done before. Yes, I was just wanting to ask Kim the, about the feedbacks because one thing I'd heard was that with global warming, average wind speeds are actually going to decrease and this is going to have an effect on things like wind, wind energy production. And so although there are more hurricanes on average, as I understand it, the wind is going to decrease and it was higher in glacial, it's known to have been higher in cold glacial periods. So I just wonder if that will be feed, that will have some sort of feedback. If there's less wind, then there's less aerosol. So, it's, so there's some rather interesting feedback between you know, the, the role of the wind and uh, so forth. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're reading different literature because I just read a paper this last week that said the winds are going to increase. Oh, right. So we should okay. swap papers. Yeah. It sounds like, I bet, bet that it's not known because I literally just read that they're going to get higher. So we should swap yeah. our papers. Yes. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely either way, there are feedbacks that are happening, yeah. right? And so, it, and these, and what I will tell you is that these microbes are having a, could have a big impact on these hurricanes. One of the questions back to sort of this geoengineering concept, is that if you, nobody really knows like why certain, you know, hurricanes are scooting across. One of the questions is, if we understood that better, could we just sprinkle a few bacteria or a little dust in there and slow it down before it hits land? That's one of the big questions that's out there. But yeah, the winds and the feedbacks, they're all, yeah. It's so you, you mentioned the Gaia hypothesis yep. uh, and James Lovelock and um, there are a couple of, thoughts came to mind. One of them was in his very early days when he was working in a medical laboratory, um, he was trying to kill bacteria and he found that he couldn't, he was irradiating them and uh, they were protected by the mucus and the water surrounding them. So probably aerosols, in fact, I don't know, I don't think he used that term, I have to go and check now. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're very well protected against even medical irradiation. And the other thing was he was also talking about um, organics or possibly bacteria coming from the oceans and seeding clouds. That was again one yeah. of his earlier ideas. So a lot of people you said have, have you know, aimed at debunking the Gaia hypothesis, but a couple of, couple of points link back very mm -hmm. nicely. But I was wondering, uh, kind of in a Lovelockian vein, some of these, um, the bacteria, you know, you've got them marked as red. These are the guys that really want to be up there. Mm -hmm. And some of them are blue, they really want to stay down there. They know exactly where they want to be. Uh, do you know why? That's a great question. So 
you know, we've just, this is sort of pretty neat, new research for us. And what we've been able to do, I haven't had another slide, I had too many slides, so I took that out. But there's these ones called carinobacteria that are just incredibly hydrophobic cell walls. And so they just tend to be very attracted, you know, to that bubble air, bubble interface. The question we don't, like, is that, I think what you're getting at is, is there a method to their madness, right? Are they the ones that are needing to get out to disperse themselves, right, exactly. to get, right, and that we don't know yet. But um, that's, the, that's, what we're gonna, that's what we're going after next. That's a great question, yeah. May I ask a follow-up to what uh, Friedhelm said in terms of the kind of scary situation we, we have uh, with all those bacteria and viruses running around the, the earth? Is there, you mentioned the, the word tipping point. Is there a tipping point in, in, in that pr precise field? Is there a moment where, I don't know, with more heat, more, more climate, climate change, more, more sprays, this situation could turn bad? I don't know about turning bad, but it's definitely changing. And I think there's two, two answers that come to mind on this, is that the one thing that's happening is, this, as we talked about last night a little bit, that the circulation patterns are changing, right? So the water's falling in different places. And like in California, it's falling in the wrong place. It's not falling where the dams are. These bacteria are really good from a water perspective, which we care a lot about. So there's that. But then from a tipping point perspective, the part that I worry the most about is how much humans are changing the microbes in the ocean. And, you know, we hear about fish, you know, well, we've just fished the ocean out. We see depletion of all kinds of species, what we visually see, but the microbes are are being affected. And if we affect that whole food chain, I worry about the ocean and us just shifting that to the point of collapse is my concern. But again, it's sort of like ocean or air, which one do you, you know, they have different effects. But those are the two that I think about. Sorry, another question. Um, <laughs> so you, you moved everything into the lab yeah. on the grounds that you were unable to go to any non-polluted place on Earth. and so. But then, as I understood it, you were moving actual seawater with the actual bacteria and viruses and so on into the lab as well. How did you kind of avoid bringing in the pollutants and so on? That's a, boy, you, that's a, that's one that I didn't appreciate. You caught me on that one. So when I said that we were trying to get away from the pollution, I was, my brain was on the air, because that's what I think about, but you nailed it. We are bringing in the water pollutants. You know, you can't, especially in the coastal water, you can't get away. So, and we're bringing in more coastal microbes, which are very different than the open ocean. So no, we are doing coastal studies of the uh, ocean. How, how big are the waves in the open ocean in general in comparison to the shallower seas? Yeah, I mean, they can get huge, right? 10, ten feet or more, right? Ours, the deepest our waves can get is three, like three feet. And we can get up to... Uh, 70 miles per my, mile per, oh, sorry, I'm in mile per hour, don't make me convert it. 70 mile per hour winds, we're working our way up to 100 mile per hour, so hurricane force winds, yep. I think it's time to open the floor for questions, so I'll ask for more light so that I see the, the person Ooh. having questions. If I, there is one, uh, please the mic here, and then we'll go online, there's a question online too. Professor Frother. Brother, <clears throat> thank you very much for this brilliant presentation, a bit frightening. The <laughs> fact you've been able to take the complexity of life and reproduce it in a lab is, is brilliant. I just have a three-word question, having seen what you've shown us. Are we doomed? No. <laughs> Not while we're still trying. No, I won't give up. We need to learn things more quickly, but we need everybody to stay part of this, and I, I will never give up. You know, we are learning a lot really fast right now. That gives me optimism. You know, before when we had these huge gaps in our understanding, I was getting a little nervous, but we're learning things really, really fast right now. So that's, and a lot of people are. So there's a lot of people working really hard. So, you know, we do, I do think we have to do a we have to be prepared. We have to understand the system and the feedbacks and all that, you know, to really get, because it's changing so fast, right? But no, I, I don't, I hope, I don't think we're doomed. Harold Morovitz, sorry, Har Harold Morovitz, a great biophysicist, said that optimism is a moral imperative and mm -hmm. it, it begins to feel more and more true. That's true. Online, there's one online. Yeah, there is a... Uh, 
It should be okay. Ça va tout seul. Ah, uh, there is a question about uh, DNA, whether you, you found DNA strands or par par fraction of strands of DNA in the sea sprays, and if you sequenced it and, and did some statistics on it. Yeah, so we do, so far all we've looked at is the DNA for all of our sequencing, and we do shotgun sequencing, right, to, to figure out what the species we have. We haven't done a super deep dive, as deep of a dive. We found that we were, we've been challenged with, when you sample the air, you sort of break things down a lot, so we don't get long, what they call long enough reads. So now we're working towards doing that better, where we can start to get more statistics and really figure out. We just did a quick peek, you know, to figure out sort of at a high level what's there, but we need to do more for like digging deeper and seeing what the different things that are there. And the other thing we're adding that we just have been adding is the RNA. We're also looking at RNA, and we're also looking at just free DNA that's floating in the air. We're trying to look at everything. Um, at as much as we can learn about the DNA and the RNA in the air. There's another question here. Yes, there is. Thank you for <coughs> this very lively uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, at some point you showed um, some kind of phylogenetic tree with bacteria and either an increased representation or an increased concentration of some bacterial species in air relative to their representation in the sea. Right. And I was wondering whether uh, uh, the ecological niche of these bacteria, their natural place where they, they thrive and divide, is the sky rather than the oceans. Yeah, I mean, that is the question. That's a really good question. And that's what we're trying to understand. Like, do they, it's not just, you know, the sky where I think people are starting to look more, because I didn't talk about this, we also capture rain and snow, right? Which, so it gives us kind of another picture of what's going on in liquid water up high, right? And that's a place where we know that these things are active. Um, I, we know they remain active. Uh, a lot of times people have asked us, well, they're not still going, but we actually, I mentioned I had one little word, enzymes, on there. And we actually showed that not only do the enzymes, which are the indicator of the bacteria remaining active, not only do they remain active, they become a thousand times more active in the air than they were in the water. So, you know, it's just it, like kind of everywhere we look, because it's, we talk, I think this week there's been a lot of discussion about you have a new tool, all of a sudden you start discovering things, and we're scrambling like crazy right now to figure out, you know, these, there's so many holes we can go down and what we're trying to figure out to your you know kind of your point like that's a really interesting question we're trying to figure out like what do we what do we dig into because there's there's quite a few rabbit rabbit holes right and so what's going to my my attitude is i have you know 10 years left or whatever to help this planet so what's going to you know what's going to do that and so that's where we'll go but to your point yes i think that things could you know they are definitely staying alive and they definitely can multiply and especially when you give them water in clouds there's no question and the question is is there a reason and we don't know that yet there are two questions here so uh, let's go to the to the bottom and then we'll come back here um, yeah um also want to thank uh, professor prather for uh, the really interesting um presentation um, there's a lot of it that I don't really understand that well, I'm not from a, I'm not studying uh, anything related to science. Um, but I'm guessing one of my questions would be um, in regard to aerosols, we had this picture of some of them that are warming the climate, but also some of them that could cool down the climate. And I was just wondering, um, if, in general, what would be your stance on something quite controversial like geoengineering the climate where we could um, put, I'm, so I'm guessing it's, it would be these aerosols to cool down the climate. Would it be feasible and would we even want to do it? And what are your thoughts uh, regarding this? Yeah, yeah um, so that's a, a loaded question. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean I, it's a difficult one to answer and I, we've, I think about it a lot. I think my view is that, you know, aerosols are what people point to 
a lot, as you picked up on. Um, one of the main ways for geoengineering is not injecting them into the troposphere where they get rained out and they don't stick around. They want to inject them into the stratosphere, right? And so that's one set, you know, card that's on the table that people are saying could be a mode of cooling things off. The other one that has more to do with my research is the sea spray itself. And could you put these solar power boats out in the middle of the ocean and make sea spray and brighten and whiten the clouds? Or I think, could you let the gases come out and react and make tiny, you know, there's other things going on now that we're discovering. Maybe that's a better way. Um, in terms of geoengineering, I think we have a lot we need to learn before we would implement any of those changes. Um, I, it makes me uncomfortable because every time we have, as humans, on purpose um, made a change, there's been some unintended consequence. Having said that, we may not have any choice at some point. So I think we should understand as much as we can in the meantime. Any other comments from the, the other speakers? Uh, well, not directly related to that, but partly uh, something you said um, about um, the, in the presence of nitric acid, if I remember rightly, that the, they inverted their contents, so, which is pretty scary. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, is, is, it, is it acids generally? Is, is there something else? What about pollution in cities? And, and does this happen with aerosols containing viruses like COVID? Do they invert themselves and does yep. that make them more infectious? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are applying what we've learned on the plain old stuff that's in the atmosphere to viruses. The big question is, as you mentioned, you know, when they get launched from the surface of your lungs, they come out in respiratory fluid that looks very much, as I showed, like the surface of the ocean. And so one of the things, there's been a lot of not so great studies where they mimic lung fluid and they do it incorrectly. When you do it correctly with the right composition, one of the really interesting things that happens that we see in sea spray, and we're pretty sure it happens in viruses and COVID, is it actually, if you have calcium and lipids, it makes it, when they dry and evaporate, they make this hard gel, a solid that encases the virus that would protect the virus mm -hmm. against radiation and against acids that would let it go further and remain infectious. So there's no question that, that, that there are ways that through the production, you can't, they can be protecting themselves. So in the presence of calcium, um, so hard water, <laughs> yeah. Is there any patterns between uh, calcium content of water and, uh, and infectiousness of viruses, out of curiosity? We don't know that yet. I mean, we, we, the, the water, you know, this is a, it only happens with, we only have seen this happen, at least in sea spray, and I say now we're applying that to modeling this new computational simulations we're doing now. And it's this, it just, as I say, it creates a completely different phase. And um, some people will say, well, well, that's a divalent island, so what about magnesium? Doesn't happen with magnesium, doesn't happen with sodium, it only happens with calcium. And calcium's there in your lungs too, right? So we're trying to understand that as much as we can, but we've just started with that. We'll go there, there was one question here. And then here, yeah. Uh, I was wondering how you, you measure this, this part, because I'm thinking we are looking for a lot of trace of life in atmosphere of other exoplanet even. Can we measure this thing on other, on other planets, for example? Can we measure them? I'm sorry. Be, you, in other planets, for example. Planet. Imagine, you, you know. Yeah, I mean, for the, you mean in terms of the microbes? So people, the furthest away that people have, um, that I'm aware of, like the, their most recent was looking, they've swabbed the International Space Station and they found microbes get up that high. And they're now trying to figure out whether it was contamination that they did or whether it really was stuff that could get that high. That's all being, people are trying to figure that out right now. That's a big, big question. Can we measure it up high? Sorry, we don't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking pointing, is that an instrument we can use to measure them remotely? Yes. Yeah, you know, there have been instruments that were used, um, I'm familiar with people from Caltech, JPL, that have tried to measure um, single dust particles in other atmospheres. It should, you know, same way, you should be able to capture, I think you would have to, I think, because there'd be so few, you would almost have to have a way like a 
catcher's glove and capture them, right, on a cold, you know, they'd be cold, right? That's the good news. And trap them and then analyze them. Um, we are developing, I didn't talk about this tonight, we're taking our mass spec and we're able to now do single viruses on the fly down to 10 nanometers. So we can do it down here. I don't know, not yet up there. Um, but we plan on, we've, we've basically tailored an instrument just to go after viruses and bacteria in real time. We'll go there for a last question because time is, is running. Yes? Uh, I'd like to thank you for this presentation. Uh, so my question was, uh, but uh, um, how did you know that uh, water bubble, bu bubbles were that um, important? That's a great question, because I listen to other people. The, ocean, the, the oceanographers have known this. They have measured, and how did I know the right ones? They actually measured them on, in real breaking waves in the ocean, and they showed this beautiful curve that's incredibly reproducible. You might ask how, an add-on to that is how did they know? You stick a micro, I didn't talk about this, I showed a picture, but you stick a microphone in, and you listen to the frequency of the bubbles bursting, and that gives you their size. The really cool thing is they're now, these same oceanographers are now using bubbles to look at the melting rate of glaciers. They stick their microphones into the ice, and they, they are, for the first time, are able to tell how fast ice is melting. Again, just frequency of bubbles. Bubbles are, I think, even for volcanoes, they're everywhere and super important, but the oceanographers have known for a long time. It was we as the atmospheric chemists that were a little slow. Thank you. I'd like, <clears throat> I'd like to maybe conclude this discussion uh, by bringing you onto a, another floor, um, namely this one. Um, my colleague, Sara from Heidi News, the media partner from this event, wrote a beautiful portrait of you. And in the title, she says you're a whistleblower on the role of aerosols. And the question, and it's also for the, the four of, of you, actually, uh, what does it feel like to be a whistleblower? You, you came with this ID in the, in the COVID-19 uh, uh, early uh, months of the, of the pandemic. Um, was it hard to defend, et cetera? So in, and in general, uh, how do you feel in that role of the scientist bringing a new, controversial maybe, revolutionary ID into the, into the discussion? To be honest, I'm, I'm exhausted. You know, this, this trip was, was a godsend, you know, that I'm kind of refueling. I'm able to get, it's been, exo it was tiring and nothing like I've ever done because people's lives were at stake. I mean, I had to battle the WHO head to head. I had to battle CDC. I, I've been squawking, we've been squawking. It is exhaust, I have, I've had death threats. People don't like masks, you know, in the US it's very controversial. Um, and so it has been exhausting. How do I feel at this? I mean, I couldn't stop either because I really felt like I would sometimes want to stop because there are mean people. I've learned there are mean people in the world, but they're a minority. I have thousands of letters from people. I know people around the world now. And when I go to like land in a place, people will ask, there's people, I'm going to meet people from that I met through Twitter in Bern when I'm here you know, that are so excited to meet, finally, right? And so there's that. There's so many good people that invested their lives in this for free, you know, and we couldn't stop. And I have these letters from families saying, I know you get a bad time, but you've saved my family's life. We've never caught it. We've just followed what you said. We gave up on public health. We followed you. So now I'm feeling more, kind of more rewarded, except it's not over yet. But I'm, you know, I hope that more people are learning and I hope, you know, People here, I just will keep saying it until we can get out of it, because I believe we can. Any comments from the others? Steve? Well, just to say that um, I think any scientist that, that's um, involved in public policy, and, and particularly in areas which are so meaningful to society, is bound to come into very stressful situations. My own experience is more limited than Kim's, but um, I've been involved in, for example, on the island of Montserrat, persuading politicians in the UK that they shouldn't completely evacuate the island, um, really for political reasons, rather than scientific reasons related to the, the real risk on the island. And now I remember that being a very tense moment of interacting with the uh, politicians and civil servants about that, that particular decision, which fortunately they made the right decision. But I think that's inevitable that 
the, there's going to be those sorts of stresses. Any similar experience? Um, <clears throat> no, because I haven't been in, 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 at that intense level of government advice, but maybe to the audience, the, my message would be uh, uh, think about the message, don't kill the messenger. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I am um, not really involved in, 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 in these kind of questions at all. Um, it, it's, it's something which is a fundamental question of human interest, the origin of life or the origin of the universe and why are we here or human evolution or whatever it may be. These are big questions that um, seem irrelevant sometimes when we have these pressing problems facing the world. But I'd say two things about it. Uh, one of them is uh, we have to have something to live for. We, we culture, science is part of culture and these questions are part of w what we care about as humans. Um, and the other one is science very often, uh, as, as I think perhaps we heard this evening from Kim, the answers often come from quite unexpected places. Um, and and um, I, I think it's an important aspect of science and very often just sheer exploration of the world tells us things that we didn't know about. Um, and, and so there's this, I, I'm no canary, but um, I think for the, for the sake of the future of humanity, it's also important to keep in mind the importance of curiosity-driven research and the value of, of just science uh, to humans. I think this can be a beautiful conclusion. So thank you, all the four of you, and thank you, Kimberly, for the presentation. The last few words quickly tomorrow evening, last evening of the colloquium with Nick Lane and uh, our other speakers, of course, will be present uh, tomorrow evening for the last time before the presentation. You will be able to spend time with the Science Cup from the University of Geneva. Uh, who presents uh, experts uh, to you and uh, the show Sans et Lumière uh, at the Musée d'Art et d'Histoire uh, every night, 6.30, 7.30, 8.30, every night, even if it rains. Please go and visit it. It lasts for 20 minutes. Apparently, it's uh, magnificent. Uh, I'm looking forward to see you tomorrow again. Have a nice evening.